Uh, we want to invite you now to open up uh, your, your Bibles, to open up God's Word with us. Uh, if you don't have a Bible, that's okay. Um, the words will be on the screen. We're going to be again in First Peter. Uh, we've been in this series called Living Hope Together. Uh, today, Meredith is going to share the Word with us. Uh, this is First Peter chapter 4. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same intention, for whoever has suffered in the flesh has finished with sin. So as to live for the rest of your earthly life no longer by human desires, but by the will of God. You have already spent enough time in doing what the Gentiles like to do, living in licentiousness, passions, drunkenness, revels, carousing, and lawless idolatry. They are surprised that you no longer join them in the same excesses of dissipation, and so they blaspheme but they will have to give an accounting to him who stands ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is the reason the gospel was proclaimed even to the dead, so that though they had been judged in the flesh as everyone is judged, they might live in the spirit as God does. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be serious and discipline yourselves for the sake of your prayers. Above all, maintain constant love for one another, for love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaining. Like good stewards of the manifold grace of God, serve one another with whatever gift each of you has received. Whoever speaks must do so as one speaking the very words of God. Whoever serves must do so with the strength that God supplies so that God may be glorified in all things through Jesus Christ. To him belong the glory and the power forever and ever, amen. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that is taking place among you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you are sharing Christ's suffering, so that you may, be, may also be glad and shout for joy when his glory is revealed. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory, which is the spirit of God, is resting on you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, a criminal, or even as a mischief maker. Yet if any of you suffers as a Christian, do not consider it a disgrace, but glorify God because you bear his name. For the time has come for judgment to begin with the household of God. If it begins with us, what will be the end for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it is hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinners? Therefore, let those suffering in accordance with God's will entrust themselves to a faithful creator while continuing to do good. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. What can I have? <laughs> Thanks, Meredith. I tried to steal my Bible, though. <laughs> I'm going to need that. <laughs> uh, let's, let's pray together. Gracious God, we, uh, we give you thanks for your word. And, and God, as we've received your word, as Meredith has spoken your word, as we've taken it in, God, we take just a second to, to be, just to breathe, just to be still. God, we come from all sorts of different places. Maybe, um, maybe from a stressful place of a busy weekend, maybe from a restful place of a restful weekend. Um, but God, what, whatever it is we bring in with us today, would you give us um, ears to hear from you and a heart that's open to receive uh, what you have for us? God, would the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts together, would they be both pleasing and acceptable to you? In Jesus' name, amen. Have you ever, have you ever had a friend that like, just made you better? Have you ever had a friend who just taught you things, whether they knew they were teaching you or not? This, this friend just upped your game in whatever arena you needed your game upped. I have. I, I've told you a little bit about this friend maybe a couple times before, but this friend of mine, is, his name is Ben. Um, I, I haven't talked to Ben in, in years, actually. I, we, we don't stay in touch, but Ben was a, a huge part of my life years ago. Uh, shortly after getting married, actually, uh, and before even having kids, um, I, I was in a stage of life where God was really 
like doing something inside of me and really working on my heart. I, I found myself really like seeking to understand what it means to actually follow Jesus. I found myself seeking to understand what it means to have a, a relationship with the living Jesus. And, and, and Ben was just a huge part of this season of, of my life. A huge part of, of my growth. He taught me things, whether he, whether he knew it or not. He was teaching me all sorts of things. He taught me how to, how to lead. He taught me how to follow Jesus well. He taught me that, uh, that the Ohio State University should always be referred to as the Ohio State University. Oh, I got a, whoa, I got a couple. Gosh, guys, that's annoying. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> he, he just taught me a, a lot of things. That was funny. Um, in, in just living his life and inviting me into his life as a friend, just by doing that, he taught me what it looked like to live a life following Jesus that looked almost entirely different than the life that, that I was living at the time. And what happened is, as I watched Ben just live his life, I found myself wanting to live my life differently too. I found myself wanting to live a little bit more and more like Ben's life, and in turn, then a little bit more and more uh, like the life of Jesus. I found myself wanting to set aside those ways that I'd shown up before. Let me... Let me tell you a little bit about Kurt at this time of, of being friends with Ben. I was super into stuff. Like, I was super competitive with, like, stuff. I wanted newer, fancier stuff, a newer, fancier car, all the, all the things. Like, I wanted my house to look nicer and better than all my neighbors on the block, right? I wanted to have that place that, that like, you drive down the block, you're like, look at that place compared to all these other. Like, that was, that was me. I was pretty hung up on, on appearances and, and stuff and wanting people to think like we had it all put together like we had arrived right ben didn't live that way and as i found myself myself spending more and more time with ben i found myself wanting to show up different i wanted to set that sort of life aside i wanted to to be a, a little different to show up different Th that old lifestyle had lost its appeal right i know this sounds cliche for me to say but the old ways had to go right I wanted something new. I wanted to be free from this, this constant comparison and competition and one-upping. And really, it's all about insecurity, right? It's all about shame and not feeling like I'm enough. I wanted something different. I can't help but wonder, as Meredith shared from 1 Peter, I wonder if there's some of this wanting something new or wanting something different, wanting something better. I want, wonder if some of that shows up in chapter 4 here as well. Look at what Peter writes in verse 3 right away. He, he writes, You've already spent enough time doing what the Gentiles like to do. But remember, all, most if not all of Peter's audience, they, they, they were Gentile Christians, meaning before they started following Jesus, they were not Jewish. They were not subject to the Mosaic law. They didn't do all the festivals and rituals and, and, and sort of uh, law things that Jewish people would have been doing very honestly, they were Gentiles. So naturally, they would do the things that Gentiles liked to do. It would mean a couple things. It would mean they would be involved in either participating or watching the theater. And when I say theater, I don't mean like the Tulip Festival night show. It's not like that. Roman theater, Greek theater, this sort of cultural theater was uh, pretty, uh, what's the word? My mother would say risque. Right? Do we know what that word means? The, the Roman theater would have been pretty risque. They would have uh, been involved in things like chariot races, which would have been pretty sketchy as well. They would have been watching gladiator fights, which we've all seen the movies, right? The movies are, are pretty spot on. Gladiator fights were gruesome and bloody and gory and violent just for the sake of entertainment. Lastly, it would have meant like pervasive idol worship. There were a vast number of small G gods that these uh, Gentiles, these folks that, that, that live in this strange culture that these Christians find themselves in, these people would have spent a ton of time trying to appease and please these small G gods in the hope of prosperity, in the hope of good fortune. 
But Peter then also gives some more things. Those were kind of the cultural things. Here are some other things Peter says um, that, that the, quote, Gentiles liked to do. Things like licentiousness. This is like promiscuity, if you will. Um, things like passions and carousing and drunkenness. And what's interesting about all this list, and I, I mean, if we're honest, we, we know people that go to this list and, and will say like, here, look, the Bible says don't do this thing. But really what Peter's getting at here is not so much the thing. All these behaviors indicate a lack of self-control. All these behaviors indicate a lack of self-control. I actually think that's why these make Peter's lists. That it's probably not even so much about the thing or the behavior as much as it is about a, a, a loss or a giving up of self-control. Right? Passions make the list. How often do we, do we say that God gives us passions of our heart? Passion in and of itself is not bad or wrong. And none of us would read this and say passion is wrong. It really is about a lack of self-control. More than anything, Peter is probably avoiding giving a list of legalistic rules to follow these Gentile Christians don't know anything about legalistic rules to follow. That would be a, a burden. I really think he's giving a, a commentary on self-control. N- not only that, not only are these behaviors that include a lack of self-control, but they're also behaviors that tear down. These are behaviors that, that either tear down the, the person engaging in them or tear down someone because of the person engaging them. Remember, Jesus invites all of those that follow him to be a part of Jesus' mission to make all things right, to bring all of creation back to himself. It's to build up, to redeem, to seek shalom. And that includes for people, for you and for me, for our neighbors. So not only do these things have a lack of self-control, but they, they really tear down and tear at God's creation. So these dispersed Christians, these resident aliens, right? Remember, these are Christians that have been dispersed into places that are not theirs, into lands that are not their homes. Undoubtedly, these Christians have begun to distance themselves from these things, distance themselves from the gladiator fights or the theater or the, the, the licentiousness, right? But remember, Peter would never advocate distancing themselves from people. Remember, we talk about this third way of Jesus. This third way of Jesus that the early church was seen as being a part of the culture but not really assimilating to the culture, Right? So Peter's saying you probably distance yourselves from these things, probably not the people, but probably these things. And Peter says, keep doing it. Keep doing that. Keep distancing yourselves from those things. Why? Not out of a fear of punishment, not out of a legalistic sense of, if you don't, I'm not going to love you, says God. Keep distancing yourselves from those things because there is a better way. There's a better way. Leave those things behind. You don't need them anymore. Certainly, this would come at a cost, though, right? I want you to imagine something with me. Imagine yourself as a a first century Roman Empire citizen, okay? Not one of these Gentile Christians. You're just one of these neighborhood people, and every Tuesday night, like everybody else does, you grab your neighbor, and you go to the local gladiator fight, and you watch your favorite gladiator. Do you know what your favorite gladiator's name would be? Gluteus Maximus? Just kidding. I'm a dad. (laughs) You go to your favorite gladiator ring, you throw your coins in the ring, and you watch one gladiator beat probably to death another gladiator or a lion or some sort of exotic animal. And then you you go home. But now imagine that you say, you know, neighbor, I don't know what your neighbor's name would be, but it wouldn't be funny. It'd just be a name. You know, neighbor, 
I'm not, I don't want to go today. I, I don't want to go with you anymore. I'm just not going to do that. Or, or imagine it's Saturday, and you and that same neighbor are going to the neighborhood statue of the, of the small G God, and you put your offering at the base of the statue, and you decide, you know, I, I'm doing this because I want my crops to grow. I'm doing this because I want prosperity and good fortune. But now imagine one Saturday you say, you know what? You know what, neighbor? I, I'm not going to go with you anymore. I'm not going to go, I'm not going to give offering to this statue anymore. Do you feel the tension? Right? Do you, do you feel the tension of, of saying, you know, I, I'm, I'm not going to do that with you. I, I love you. You're my neighbor. We can still hang out and play cornhole. I'm sure they had cornhole back then, by the way. We can still be neighbors, but I'm not going to go do those things with you. Imagine the anxiety, the frustration, maybe just the flat confusion that your neighbor might feel. It's a recipe for anxiety. It's a recipe for criticism. It's a recipe for marginalization. It's maybe even a recipe for suffering. Maybe even a recipe for persecution. It makes me wonder then, I, as I prep for this, it makes me wonder what what are the things that, that we do that we don't have to do anymore? Not, not because God tells us, if you keep doing these things, I'm not going to love you, but what are the things we do that we don't have to do anymore because there's a better way? What are the things we can replace with a better way? What are the things that tear down ourselves or our neighbors? I, I, I think about a few things. I, I think about gossip. I think about triangling or, or in just... Just in general, speaking behind people's back, like I think about how prevalent that is, and sometimes we even disguise it like as a concern or even a prayer request. We're we're pretty good at that, I think, all of us. I, I think about the way we compare ourselves to others. My goodness, I told you I used to do this like daily. It just ends up competing with our then, right? We continue to ask, are we smarter than this person? Are we more well-off than this person? Are we more successful than this person? Are we more righteous than this person? I think about the ways we, we other people that are different from us. We've talked about this before, but let me say again, othering is when we look at someone who's different from us or holds different beliefs or values and we, we dehumanize them. We look at them as if they're not even human, so then it's easier for us to make them the enemy or a villain or a, a monster. But really, just people doing their best just like we are. Or, or maybe, uh, maybe there's this. We, uh, we as Midwesterners are pretty good at self-deprecation. I sometimes tell people my spiritual gift is self, self-deprecation. We're pretty good at this, but really... Really, this is just a, a gentler way to say that I'm not good enough. When we put ourselves down, it's just a, a gentler way to, to, to voice shame. But I want to say to you, I want to say to each of you today what Peter said to his audience. Leave those things behind. You don't need them anymore. Maybe you found comfort in those things in the past. Maybe they've provided you solace. Maybe putting yourself down or self-deprecating has felt good or taking the edge off discomfort. Maybe, maybe gossip has provided comfort, but you don't need them anymore. There's a better way. Hear this. Hear me say this. In Christ, you are enough. You are enough. In Christ, you are secure. In Christ, you have enough. In Christ, you are enough. In Christ, you are a child of God. Amen? Amen. You have a purpose. You have a calling. You don't need to tell yourself something about yourself that's not true. You don't need to say things about yourself that God doesn't say about you. You don't have to gossip. You don't have to compete. You don't have to compare yourself to to anyone. There is no threat. Your life is secure in Christ. And hear this too. Nothing you can do 
Nothing you can do or not do. Nothing you can accomplish or not accomplish. Nothing can make God love you more or less than he already does because of Jesus Christ. Peter tells us what this better way is. He doesn't leave it to our imagination. He tells us in verses 8 through 10, he says like this. He says, maintain constant love for each other. He says, be hospitable to each other. Serve one another with the gifts that God has given you. This, friends, is a better way. And it's yours. It's already yours. Did you notice, though, where, where Peter went next? Peter went right back to a, a, a pretty familiar place from Peter's letter. He went right back to suffering. But why suffering? Maybe you found yourself wondering, like, gosh, this feels like a whiplash shift. Why would he go back to suffering? Well, I think it's this, because this, this other way of being, this other way of being, this way of following Jesus, leaving those things that, that, that you don't need anymore, that can tend to bring about suffering. I want to read for you from a commentary. Um, this is, I, I've mentioned this a couple times. This is a commentary written by a woman named Karen Jobes. I don't know if I'm saying her name right. So if I'm saying her name wrong, you can tell me. Um, I'm going to say Karen Jobes. Uh, she wrote this about what these early Gentile Christians who decided to follow Jesus in a strange land, she, she gives us a little insight of what this would have been like for them. So I just want to read this for you. Remember, this is written about these first century Christians. Family members who broke ancestral traditions on the basis of their newfound faith showed an appalling lack of concern for their familial responsibilities. Christians deserted ancestral practices passed on since time immemorial for a novel religion of recent manufacture. The exclusivity of the Christian's religion and their refusal to take part in or to consider valid the worship of any other god but their own deeply wounded public sensibilities. Such an attitude towards the gods, small g gods, such an attitude towards the gods even branded them as atheists. Moreover, it was highly dangerous for even one segment of the community to slight the gods, small g gods, whose wrath was ever to be feared. Civic peace, the success of agriculture, and freedom from earthquake or flood were regularly attributed to the benevolence of the gods, small g gods. This is legit, like, fear. <laughs> these people, these, new, these Christians are doing something that's going to have an impact on all of us. We've got to do something. Suffering wasn't a surprise. With all of what we just read, that suffering is not a surprise. We see this all throughout, of, all throughout history, Right? people that show up, we, we, we call them martyrs, people that show up and, and cling to the faith of Jesus or to the way of Jesus and suffer and, and even eventually die. We, we call them martyrs. We've seen it all throughout history. Right? It begins with Paul and Silas who were jailed for creating public nuisance by sharing the gospel. And we read in Acts that they find themselves in, in prison singing psalms together while they're chained and contained in, in prison. We still see that today. Here's, a, here's an example. There's a, a story I found online uh, just last year uh, of a man named Cyrus. Cyrus was a, a, a maintenance technician at a local factory in an unnamed Middle Eastern country. A lot of these stories go, uh, go with vague details because there's a danger in these stories. Cyrus uh, found himself in a place. He, he heard the good news of the gospel. He converted from Islam to Christianity, started following Jesus, he shared his own story at work. He got fired for it. He found himself getting more and more pressure from local radicals, more and more threats from local radicals. So he fled his home to go to Turkey to find asylum, to, to hopefully find safety. It became clear to Cyrus that he was not going to find asylum. He was not going to receive asylum 
in Turkey, so he had no choice. No choice but to go back home. And, and almost immediately, Cyrus found himself being beaten and killed because of the way that he had shared the good news of, of his own story and who Jesus was to him. That's not all, though. His body was delivered to his family, who had not yet followed Jesus, as a blatant threat. The story has it that his family was so scared for their lives, they never, have never even gone to the authorities. This happens all around the globe, even today. Even this moment this is happening, the stories go on and on. And it's with this sort of awful suffering that we read Peter's words. And remember, Peter was killed for his faith too, which makes his words even more impactful and fascinating. He, he writes in chapter 4, If any of you suffers as a Christian, do not consider it a disgrace, but glorify God because you bear his name. And he says, Rejoice, you are sharing in Christ's suffering. Whoa. I, I want to be really clear, though, that Peter, Trinity Church, the, the church in general, is, is not holding this up, glorifying suffering just for the sake of suffering, right? We, again, we believe that Jesus invites us to be about his work, to, to set all things right, to create shalom. There is real suffering around us that we should notice and that we should stand against. I think of suffering like, uh, like, like abusive relationships. I think of suffering like people that are on the margins unjustly. This is suffering that the church should notice and stand up against and take every step to alleviate. This is a very different form of suffering. P Peter writes a, a suffering that shares in the suffering of Jesus, a suffering that comes from bearing the name of Jesus. So please don't hear, don't hear Peter advocating to ignore suffering or to glorify suffering. Rather, remember how Jesus suffered for the mission that God called him on, into, and Jesus humbly, without fighting back, without defending himself, without declaring his rights, allowed himself to suffer for you and for me. Here's what's true. Here's what I find fascinating about all of this. These stories of, of martyrs, these stories of suffering in the name of Jesus, for the name of Jesus, th these are awful. And, and their lives and their actions and, and even their deaths are a witness to God's goodness. They're a testimony to God's goodness. And, and here's what I mean. Everything we do is a witness to something or testifies to something. If I walked out of here today and walked out the front door and opened up an umbrella, that I, I would be witnessing and testifying the fact that I think it's going to rain and I don't want to get wet, right? When, when we tell our kids, hey, you got to ride your bike with a helmet. You can't ride your bike without a helmet. We are witnessing to the fact that we, we believe that the risk of injury is, is high enough to wear a helmet, right? Everything we do and say witnesses and testifies to something, even suffering. Even suffering. It testifies to the fact that we hold on to God's promises. L like this promise, like the, the, the promise that Paul writes in Romans 8. If God is for us, who is against us? And that doesn't mean we'll never have hardship. It means that God's promises are true and strong and they hold fast. It testifies to the hope that Jesus promises to set all things right, promises to end all suffering, suffering in the name of Jesus and all other suffering, to put an end to pain, to put an end to tears. 
It testifies and witnesses to the fact that who we are in Christ is our deepest identity. Our, our, most, our most intrinsic identity, the, the, the truest self of who we are. That nothing, no suffering, no institution shaking, nothing can take that identity away from us. This sounds pretty staggering. I don't know about you, but these stories of suffering, they sound pretty staggering and daunting, right? So maybe you're asking what I asked this week. Like, how, how the heck do we do this? How would we, how would we ever find the courage or the strength to follow Jesus and endure suffering? Peter, again, helps us out. He ends chapter 4 with the how. Here's what he says. He says, we do that by entrusting themselves, entrusting our lives to a faithful creator while continuing to do good. While continuing to do good. What does it look like to entrust our lives? It looks like surrender. It looks like surrendering control. It looks like surrendering our identity. It looks like surrendering all the things that are at stake when we, when we decide to follow Jesus. I want to tell you something else about Ben, my friend. Ben had a couple, like, rules to live by. He, would never, he didn't call them rules, but I, I, I would call them, like, rules to live by. One of them uh, was that he just flat refused to talk about someone if they weren't in the room either positively or negatively. He just would refuse. He, he wouldn't talk about a person at all if they weren't in, in the room. And I gotta tell you, honestly, that's pretty jarring. Because I don't know if you've ever tried this, but like, it's pretty common that we talk about people that aren't in the room. <laughs> I remember feeling like, Ben, what, what are we gonna talk about? <laughs> right? <laughs> like, it's pretty jarring if we're honest, but objectively, it's a good practice. Objectively, it was a better way to show up than the alternative. So I tried it <laughs> years ago. I, I tried it. I decided that this was something I wanted to take from Ben, whether he was giving it to me on purpose or not. Something that I, I wanted to try. Um, I, I'll, I'll say it again. It's super hard. And frankly, I don't still do a great job of it. Um, it's just so hard. If you've never tried it, try it. It's so hard. But what's also true is that it causes a lot of anxiety. Changing the dance, if you will, changing the way we show up like that, when it's so common to show up one way, and now you show up another way, that, that really drives anxiety. Here's what I want you to try. Whether it's at work or home or family dinner today at noon or whatever it is, at school, wherever it is, try it sometime. When someone starts talking about someone who's not in the room, just, just refrain and then when someone says, hey, what, what, do you, what do you think? Just say, yeah, you know, I don't, I don't think I want to do that. I, I don't think I want to do that. It's pretty unsettling for folks, just like it was pretty unsettling for me. And if I'm honest, doing it is pretty unsettling. I, you know, I, most of you know me. I'm a people pleaser. I'm a harmonizer. I want all the groups I'm with to get along and be happy and sing Kumbaya. That'd be great. Maybe we can do that after the service today. So, so when I decide to show up a different way and the system I'm in or the group I'm in starts to say, ooh, I don't know if we like this, it's really hard. It's really hard. And, and I know it's better. And I know it's more faithful to, to the way of Jesus. See, when someone like my friend Ben when someone like him shows up in, a, in an intentional way like that and makes a choice to say, I'm going to leave this behind in favor of this, this new way, this better way that's objectively both better for him, better for others, and more faithful to the way of Jesus. When someone like Ben does that, there's always a risk, and there's always a cost, and it always requires that someone like Ben entrusts his life, entrusts his relationship, entrust his status, entrust what people are going to say about him to a faithful creator, as Peter says. 
And I think entrusting and doing good go hand in hand, right? I actually think that this, this behavior like Ben, I think this sort of entrusting God where, where Ben says, look, people are going to think I'm kind of weird, and that's okay because I trust God to put people around me that don't think I'm weird. I think when the church entrusts their lives to God and continues to show up that way, friends, I think this is what makes the church distinctive. I think this is what makes the church beautiful. I think this is what makes the church attractive. Frankly, I think this is what we're called to, is to entrust our lives to God and continue to do good, to show our communities, to show our neighbors that there is a better way to show our communities and our neighbors and our coworkers the way of Jesus, the same Jesus that says, come to me, come to me. All of you that are tired from all the things, come to me. I want to give you rest. Come to me. Oh, and my yoke is light. I think this is what makes the church distinctive. May we be that church. May we be the church that shows up and says, we're going to entrust our lives to God and we're going to, we're going to continue to do what's good, even when it's hard, even when it might mean suffering, because this is the good news of Jesus. Because this is what we're called to. May we do that well, may we do it faithfully, may we honor God together. I, I want to invite you to something today. In just a second, the band is going to come back up, and they're going to, they're going to lead us in our, our last song together. Um, we're also going to have a couple elders up here. Steve and Amanda, they're, they're a couple of our elders on this campus. They're going to be up front here, and, and they would love to pray with you. If, if, if you're experiencing suffering, maybe in the name of Jesus, maybe just pain and suffering that, that you want to entrust to God, Maybe not to take away. Maybe God doesn't take it away, but maybe you want to hand it to God and say, I, I trust you. We want to invite you to come up and, and one of our elders, again, Amanda or Steve, will, will pray with you. So, again, feel free to make your way up during the song. Um, it would just be a pleasure to be able to share those moments with you. I, I want to also name if... If you do feel like you want to come up and have an elder pray with you, I want to leave it up to you. You can either name to them, hey, I'd love for you to pray for me this way. I want to entrust God with this. And they would love to pray that specific prayer for you and with you. Or you can just come and let them pray a prayer of healing, a prayer of hope, and a prayer of peace over you this morning too. Either of those ways is completely fine. So before we do that, let's pray together. Gracious God, we name your goodness. We name your, your power, we name your might, your authority, your sovereignty. Your, the, the way that you care for us, the way that you call us your own, we name that you are the God of the universe. We give you thanks even in your, your power and your might and your sovereignty you have decided because of your deep love for us that you would send Jesus that, that we might be reconciled to you for none of our own doing but only because you love us. God, would we experience that love today? Would we experience that presence, that comfort of, of, of being called your children, your daughters and your sons maybe even in a season of suffering. God, would you give us courage and peace and comfort to entrust our lives to you, the faithful creator. We pray this in Jesus' name.